Before we begin our service, our uh, devotional period here in just a moment, I wanted to give you a quick update. I talked to June Stedman just a few minutes ago. Um, it's looking like Raymond did have a possible heart attack this afternoon. He was transported to Princeton. June is over there with him now, and uh, they are running tests. So they don't know if he will be staying tonight or how long he's going to be staying if he is admitted. Uh, but they are running an echo and two or three other EKGs and some other tests and blood work on him right now. So we want to have prayer for him, and then we'll turn it over, and Kelly can do the announcements and the singing. Let's pray. Holy and righteous Father, we truly thank you for your love. Father, we thank you for blessing us so richly, and we thank you for our Midway family, and we thank you for your son. We pray, Father, at this time that you would be with Raymond and June. Pray that you'd especially be with Raymond and the doctors and the nurses and the medical teams as they work with him. And we pray, Father, that you, we would just lift him up to you and that you'd wrap him in your arms, that you'd help him to recover quickly and, and for the outcome to be good. And we pray, Father, that you'd continue to watch over us, care for us, and forgive us our sins and comfort us when you can. In Christ's name, amen. The only announcement that I had was uh, you know, about the, the relief that we are doing for Amory. We've had a lot of stuff brought so far, um, but I do need help loading here after class. So if you could come help me, it looks like we're going to, have to fit it. It's not going to fit on my truck. We're going to, have to fit it on the bus. So anybody that could come help me after class, that'd be greatly appreciated. Loading up, uh, loading up the back of the bus because they're using it tomorrow, so we can only load at the back for tonight. But I appreciate your help. As far as tonight, sailors will come with us in opening prayer. I'll have the singing, and then Mark has our 90 seconds of power. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful day that you've given us, Lord. Thank you for allowing us all to assemble here, Lord, to grow stronger in our faith, to grow stronger to each other, Lord. Just help us to do that always. Lord, help us to go through the rest of this week, the rest of this year. Help us to show you in all our actions, Lord. Be with all those on the prayer list, all those in the bulletin, Lord. Just be with them. All the ones that are hurting, Lord, just be with them, the ones that lost loved ones. Thank you for sending your wonderful son Jesus down the cross for us. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. pulled over by a policeman, and he got a ticket for not having on his seatbelt. Two days later, he's coming back home, coming home from work, gets pulled over again, same police officer, same ticket. And so the police officer looks at him and said, Sir, have you learned anything yet? And the man said, Yes, sir, I sure have. I need to take another way home from work. <laughs> Isn't that just the way we are sometimes? We don't really want to change the behavior, or probably I should say misbehavior. 
We just want to do it in a different place. Now, he may be able to do it somewhere where that police officer is not. But when it comes to us and when it comes to the things that we do in life, when it comes to potential sins that we commit, you know what? We can't go anywhere where God isn't. When we think about that, we think about passages like the one in Psalm 33. In Psalm 33, verses 13 through 15, the psalmist wrote and said this, The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them uh, all and observe all, observes all their deeds. In other words, God sees everything. If you turn to the pages of the New Testament, book of Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 13, the writer of the book of Hebrews puts it this way, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You know, in some ways that's very scary that we think about God seeing everything. But when I think about what is said in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, one of the greatest comforts that I have is what is said in verses 14 through 16. You see, if we stop in verse 13, we might get alarmed. But if we go on to verses 14 through 16, we have hope. The Bible goes on and says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Indeed, we may have learned that we think that we can go somewhere where God is not, but God is everywhere. And God is watching, God sees, God knows, and we'll give an account to God. But the great thing about it is we have one who's lived for us, one who's died for us, and one who makes it possible for us to have that grace and mercy that we need when we do mess up. Maybe this morning or this evening that there's something that you need to make right in your life. It may be tonight that you need to put your Lord on in baptism. Whatever your need might be, if we can assist you tonight, come right now as we stand and sing. see everyone here tonight. So thankful you've chosen to be with us. We're in Acts chapter number nine. We're down at verse number eight. And that's where we'll actually start our discussion tonight. What I want to do though is go back and read beginning in verse number six and go through verse number eight in order to be able uh, to catch up where we are. Now notice what he said here in verse number six. We have God or Jesus speaking to Ananias or to Saul rather on this uh, at this particular time. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. As we look at this section, <coughs> we know the Lord has appeared to him. That's that bright, blinding light uh, that has shone down. And now, as the Lord has spoken to him, and we've gone through Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26, and noticed some things that were said by the Lord to Saul. But the thing that we're focusing on right now is what he tells him to do. He said, rise 
and get up and go into the city. Now looking at verse number 8, what do we find? So, or Saul rather, rose from the ground. In other words, what we're reading here in verse number 8 is this. Saul begins to do exactly what the Lord told him to do, right? He says, rise. He says, get up. And now Saul gets up. Saul gets up. He gets ready to go into the city so that he can be told what he is going to do. However, even though we uh, see him getting up, we also see another problem that he encounters. And, and all of us probably are quite familiar with, with the story that has been told here in Acts chapter number 9. But when he gets up and starts looking around, what does Saul see? What is it that appears as he is trying to, to look around? After he gets up off of the ground, can you imagine being like Saul at this point, getting up off the ground, and as you look at it, he was able to see nothing. He saw nothing. Nothing. This word nothing is from a compound word in the original language. The first part means neither, nor, or probably best in this case, not even. And the second part of this word is simply the, the numeral one. The numeral one. And so literally, when you look at this word, he saw not even one thing. He saw not even one thing. You know, sometimes people who are blinded can actually see some things, can't they? There are some who can see movement. There are some who can see a little bit of light. If you talk to different people, you can find a lot of different variations on blindness, you know, uh, different uh, levels sometimes of blindness. But when Saul gets up off of the ground, he sees not even one thing. That's an amazing thought. Not even one thing, not even one man, not even one woman, or not even in this case, which is in the neuter sense, not even one thing. Now as we look at the passage, we understand and we know, having put all of the passages together where we have the story of, the, uh, of Paul's, or Saul's experience here on the road to Damascus, we know that his blindness was caused by the light that he had seen. Now how do we know that? It doesn't say that here, does it? But if we go to Acts chapter 22... At verse number 11, we have the report given to us there where Paul says, And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. Okay? Now we're going to talk about the ones who lead him into Damascus more in just a minute. But I want to think about this blindness. He couldn't see. couldn't see not even one thing. And the reason for that is because of the light. Now, had the others not seen the blinding light? Well, yes, we know that they did. But evidently, they had not looked into that light as Saul had done. But here's something that Brother Wayne Jackson notes in his uh, commentary on the book of Acts. He's actually citing what is said by A.T. Robertson in his uh, work, word, word Pictures in the New Testament. He said... Uh, that, he, that uh, Mr. Robins, Robertson makes a judicious comment that his blindness, now watch this, constitutes evidence that this was no mere hallucination. It wasn't a, a hallucination that he saw. You know, sometimes people say that I see something and, and everybody else standing around them says, no, you don't. Have you ever been to... Maybe someone, and we're not making fun of them because we understand that they're in trouble sometimes, but have you ever been to a nursing home or even a hospital room? And like my dad did one time, says, do you see all those bugs crawling up the wall? No, I don't see a single bug. There's not one over there. But it was to him as real as anything. Sometimes people see things, they hallucinate they believe they've seen some things. You couldn't convince him on that day that he hadn't seen anything. Okay, He believed they were over there. 
But it wasn't a hallucination for Saul, was it? What's the evidence of it? One, one evidence of it. He can't see not even one thing. After he's seen this, he cannot see anything. And so I thought that was a pretty good observation in regard to what happens here. God doesn't do anything by accident, does he? God always has a purpose for what he is doing. And sometimes when we look at things, we may look at them and say, well, you know what, I see where that could happen, but why? Why did it happen? Why did it happen to Saul and not the other folks? Because we know it didn't happen to them because what they do? They were able to see enough to get Paul on into the city, even though they themselves witnessed that there was a light that was there. Now, here's something else. And I think it was Brother Bobby uh, Nunnally that brought it up a couple of weeks ago that some of the commentators say that the group that was traveling with Saul that was going to Damascus from Jerusalem, that they may have been traveling in chariots or horseback or something of that nature. And, and the reason I bring that up here is, is, is this. I, I, I guess... I, I, I ask myself the question as I'm studying, can we really know for certain? Can we know whether they were walking, whether they were riding, whatever it may have been? And, and I'd say that we, we probably can in this case if you read closely. And isn't that what we're seeking to do? To study the Bible very closely to find out what is going on? Now, first of all, let me simply suggest this to you. If you go back to Acts chapter 9 at verse 4, and then also go and compare what is said in Acts chapter 26 at verse 14, what happened to the men when they saw the light? We've already talked about tonight, Saul has fallen to the ground, has he not? What about the folks who were with him? What happened to them? doesn't say here, but if you go over to the book of Acts chapter 26, verse 14, how many of them fell to the ground? All of them fell to the ground. Now this light, as we've already talked about, happened how? Happened suddenly. It was like a flash. And they fell to the ground. What if they'd been on a horse? How would they have fallen to the ground from a chariot? And so I'm, what I'm saying is this, there's some clues within the text itself as we look at it. But now looking at where we are in this passage as we continue on, what do we find happening here in verse number 8? He saw nothing. The others were not affected. But what did they do? Last part of verse number 8. They led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. If they had been in a chariot what would they have done? Loaded him back in the chariot. If he had been on a horse, they would have put him back on the horse. Could he have sat on the horse being blind? Well, sure. But they would have not led him by the hand, would they? They would have led the horse. Doesn't that make more sense? And so when we begin to study the Bible, the only reason I bring that up is not so I can disprove what the commentators say. The only reason I bring it up is this, and I've already said it tonight, when you're studying the Bible, study it word for word. Study it very, very closely. Now let me just add to that this, the idea where it says they led him by the hand there in verse number uh, 8, in the original language, uh, that's only one word. Only one word. They led him by the hand. And, and it's a compound word. Those two words that go together to make one word. One of those words means hand. The other one simply means to lead. So literally, the word itself, they took him by the hand to lead him around. That's the idea behind it. And then there's the word brought. The word brought. They could have 
it could be said, said that if he was in a chariot, he could be brought. Could he not? Unless you look at the definition of the word translated brought in this passage. That word also means to lead or bring, to introduce, to conduct, or to usher. In other words, to lead the meaning of the word. They led him by the hand and they, what did they do? It's not a redundant thing. They led him by the hand, that's how they were doing it, but they led him by the hand into the city. They ushered him into the city. And this word is used in other passages and, and, and pretty, you know, it's helpful when you start thinking about that. But here's the, the, the man Saul. He's had an experience out here on this road to Damascus that sometimes I'm not sure that we, I, I know we know the story. I know we've read it. I know we know what the words say. But, but put yourself back there in Paul's sandals. Okay? Think about how you would feel if you were traveling, you knew what you were doing, you had a goal, you had a mission, and everything was all set, everything was ready to go, and then all of the sudden, all of this takes place, and when it ends, you're not like you were before. Now, he's, he's going to make a lot of changes in his life, but he's not even like he was before at this point physically. I can't see a single thing. Okay? And so they, they lead him into the city. All right? Going on to verse number 9. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Some commentators seek to argue uh, some sort of connection here. How many days was he in the city without eating and drinking? Three. They try to argue there's some sort of connection with the three days that Jesus spent in the grave. I'm not sure there's any justification for that. There's nothing in any of the other texts that indicates anything in regard to that. And so sometimes, even when we're studying as carefully as we can, we need to be careful that we don't make too much of what is said in, in these passages. But for three days, he doesn't eat, he doesn't drink. Brother J.W. McGarvey, in his commentary on the book of Acts, writes this paragraph. He says, The physical effect of the intense light into which he had gazed upon his eyesight was not more painful than the moral effect of the whole scene upon his conscience. The former trade, uh, uh, the former rather, made him blind. The latter filled him with remorse. To this feeling alone can we attribute his total abstinence from food and drink. The awful crime of fighting murderously against God and Christ was pressing upon his soul. And as yet he knew not what to do, what he might, that he might obtain pardon. His Jewish education, if not his natural instinct, prompted him to pray. And this he was doing with all fervor, according to verse number 11 when we get to it. But the hands he lifted up were stained with blood, the blood of martyrs. And how could he hope to be heard? Here's a sinner. A sinner who himself claims to be greater than all other sinners. And he's been taught in his Jewish background that he needs to pray, but he's also been taught in his Jewish background God doesn't hear sinners, and now here he is in that situation. And yet he's praying anyway. No penitent, Brother McGarvey goes on, no penitent ever had greater cause for sorrow or wept more bitterly than he. I asked you a moment ago to put yourself in the place of Saul. Maybe you were thinking only about the blindness and the things that happened there. But to put Brother McGarvey's words in another 
way. Yeah, he was worried about the sight, but he's probably more worried about the soul. More worried about his condition that he now finds himself. But Wayne Jackson goes on and says, Yet in spite of his obvious penitence, he was still lost. For his sins had not yet been washed away. We know that by going to Acts chapter 22, verse number 16. And so I ask you this. If you put yourself back in the shoes, sandals, I said a while ago, oh, what would you have done? What would you have done? When you got to the city, when they led you there, first thing we probably would say was, take me to the emergency room. I need something done, right? There was none. There were doctors, were they not? Who wrote the book of Acts? Who penned it? Who's the writer? What was his job? He was a doctor. So there were doctors, physicians. But there was no help for him. And he's sitting there, not just thinking about his blindness, thinking about his soul. And for three days, he was without sight, and neither ate or drank. Verse 10. There was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. Now, let's think about this passage for just a moment. Ananias was a common name in the first century. We know of at least three men by the name of Ananias in the New Testament. If we go back to Acts chapter 5, at verse number 1, we find a man by the name of Ananias there, don't we? We also know his wife's name. What, what is, who is this Ananias back in Acts chapter 5? Ananias and Sapphira. And by this time, we know that it's not this Ananias, because where's Ananias at this time? He's in the graveyard. So it's not this Ananias. That's one Ananias that we find in the Bible, but it's not that one. If you go to Acts chapter 23, verse number 2, we find another Ananias. In that passage, the Bible says, And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Now, this Ananias, called the high priest in this passage, tells the people who are standing around to strike him on the mouth. Who is he giving a command to strike on the mouth? Paul. Probably not that Ananias either, is it? When we think about this Ananias, don't get him confused with another man that his name is Close, who was a high priest, who is mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse number 6. His name is Annas. Annas, not Ananias. His name is Annas. In Acts chapter 4, verse 6, uh, six with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas, John and Alexander and so forth. Tyndall says about the Ananias in Acts chapter 23 at verse number 2. He said, this Ananias had been appointed as high priest in A.D. 47 and was dismissed in A.D. 58-59. Now remember... Under the Old Testament, the Jewish high priests were high priests how long? Like a Supreme Court judge. Once you become the high priest, you're a high priest for life. But when, it, when we get to the New Testament, who has sort of taken over the, what's going on? Well, the Roman government has sort of started putting men in to the position of the priest at Jerusalem... Okay, they're running, got, they want their hand in everything. And so they appoint Annas, or Ananias rather, in A.D. 47. He's dismissed in A.D. 58 or 59. And then later, this Ananias was assassinated. 
because he was accused of being pro-Roman. Even in that time, what were the Jews still wanting? They wanted, they wanted somebody to free them from the Romans. But this high priest is accused of being uh, a pro-Roman, and so some Jewish guerrillas, uh, as Tyndall puts it, uh, killed him in A.D. 66. Okay? Uh, the reason he is dismissed is because the Romans suspected him of being responsible for some riots in uh, Judea. And so uh, they had suspected him of that. They had acquitted him of that charge, but he had lost grace in their sight. That's another Ananias in Acts chapter 23. But then we have this man named Ananias who lives now in Damascus. He's the one that we're reading about here. Do we know anything much about him? Well, one of the one of the things that we know about him is found in Acts 22, verse 12. Okay? What is said about Ananias there in Acts chapter 22, verse number 12? This is, again, one of the, it's the second account of Paul's conversion. What is said about Ananias in that passage? He's a devout man according to what? What law? He's a devout man according to the Old Testament law. Okay? which meant that he had done his best at, at, while he was under the Old Testament law to do what? Do everything that he possibly could to be a good Jew. And not only had he done that, but if you notice there in Acts chapter 22 at verse number 12, what else is said about him? Well spoken of by who? By the Jews. Now, is he a Christian or is he a Jew? <laughs> Evidently he's a Christian, right? But even those who were Jews still did what? Said this is a good man. Do we sometimes make statements like well, I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm going to do, and then fill in the blank. Does Ananias appear to live by that way of thinking? Does he? Why? Because even those who were Jews, if he's now become a Christian, even those who are Jews can't really find anything bad to say about him. And if you think about the setting of the day, that's somewhat unusual, isn't it? What was Paul seeking to do? He is a Jew who is seeking to put an end to Christianity and there were many other Jews who were on the same page. But evidently not in regard to this Ananias. Tradition says, we don't have any way of backing this up from Scripture, but tradition says that this Ananias is the one who came and preached the gospel in Damascus. He was the one, you know, who, who went to uh, uh, Samaria? and preach the gospel. Acts chapter 8. Philip went to Samaria and preached the gospel. Ananias is said, we don't have any backup in Scripture, but tradition says he was the one who went on to Damascus and began preaching the gospel in order to establish the church in that city. We do know some other things about him that we'll see here in just a moment. We know, number one, he's known by the Lord, don't we? There was a disciple, a learner, one who is a Christian, at Damascus named Ananias. By the way, Ananias is a Jewish name. And the Lord said to him, 
the Lord had evidently taken notice of the things that Ananias was doing or at least was capable of doing, right? The Lord said to him, he was known by the Lord. When we, when we look at this part of it though, the Lord said to him, to, to whom does Ananias, he, he's going to answer, he's going to say, here I am, Lord. But who are we talking about? To whom does Ananias refer here when he calls him Lord? Now remember, when we were talking about Saul on the road, do you remember that when Jesus spoke to Saul, he called him Lord. But what was the question that Saul asked? Who are you? It doesn't seem that Ananias has any, any problem identifying who's talking to him. Okay? And we'll see that develop more in just a moment. But who is this Lord that he is speaking to? In other words, if somebody asks you that question out on the street, I know what you'd say, well, he's talking to Jesus. But you know what I always ask, don't you? How do you know that? In other words, I want some, I want some scripture behind it, right? I want to know what the Bible says. Okay? Look at verse 17. Chapter 9, verse 17. This is after Ananias goes to see Saul. It says, He departed, entered the house, laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me. To whom was Ananias speaking? To whom was he calling, or of whom did he refer to him as Lord? Jesus. He referred to Jesus as the Lord. And so, again, you know, as we look at it from Scripture, okay? Now, I want you to notice something else here in this passage. I want you to look at what is said, the Lord said to him. The Lord said to him in a vision, the Lord said, this is one word in English, actually two words in Greek, but one word in English. When you use together these two Greek words, take the form of a command. Not just necessarily the Lord is speaking to him. The Lord said to him. In other words, it takes the form of a command. When, he, when he talks to him, what is he doing? He's telling him to do something. He's giving him something to do. He's giving him a command. Doesn't look like a command, does it? The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, is that a command? Uh, no. Not really just calling him by name, just addressing him. Ananias addresses him back. It's not until we get down to verse number 11 that we get the meaning or the command that has been given. What's the command? Rise and go. Rise and go. Now, I said that to say this, when you get down to verse number 11, does anybody, I'm going back for a minute to verse number 10, so don't get too comfortable getting away from it. Does anybody have uh, the King James or the New King James of verse number 11? And if you look at the word said there, does it look funny? And when something is in italics in the King James or the New King James, it's supplied. It's not in the original language. And so, literally, when we, when we have what we have down here in verse number 11, it is not the Lord saying, He's already said, He's already given the command that we start reading here, but down in verse number 11, 
uh, there's some words that are left out. The Lord to him. The Lord to him. Didn't say said. The Lord to him. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But he's giving him a command. He's giving him something to do. All right? When this is being said, when the Lord is giving this command, how is he giving this command to Ananias? The Lord said to him in a vision. I think that's significant. The word translated vision means to be seen, to have sight, to have a sight divinely granted. It's the same word that's used in regard to Saul in verse number 12. That we'll talk about more in just a moment. My question is this, did Ananias just hear some words? Or did Ananias see Jesus, who was telling him to go to Saul? Okay, different purpose for certain. Okay. He didn't need to, he didn't need to appear to him to make him an apostle. But my question is, did he see him or did he just hear him? The word choice is significant. Ananias evidently was able to see Jesus on this occasion. On this occasion. How privileged was he? I don't know if he had lived in Jerusalem before time. Maybe he had seen Jesus traveling down the streets. Maybe he had seen him at other times. Maybe he had even seen him do miracles. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. We don't know that much about him. But one thing we do know, like Saul, he was privileged, according to this passage, to lay his eyes on him, to behold him, and to hear the words that are given to him. What an amazing thing. Well, the Lord said to him in a vision, okay. What does that mean? Probably more than what we, what we think, to, just looking at it on the surface. He knew exactly who it was he was talking to. <clears throat> He's going to want to mildly object, as one writer puts it, to what he tells him to do here in a minute. But he speaks to the Lord. What does Ananias say? Here I am, Lord. When the Savior called him, he was listening and he responded, didn't he? He responded to him. Does that remind you of anything out of the Old Testament? Samuel. Samuel? Okay. What about Isaiah? I heard, of, heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, Lord. Now finish that up. We sometimes sing a song. I don't think we've sung it in a long while. Lord, send me. Here I am, Lord, send me. The only problem was <clears throat> when uh, Ananias hears what he wants him to do, he said, mm, I'm not sure about that, Lord. Let's, let's, think about, <laughs> let's talk about this in a little bit, okay? Lord, here I am, okay? Going on, let's go on to verse number 11. Verse number 11. The Lord said to him, Rise, and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. Now let's, we'll just stop right there for a moment. The Lord said to him, we've already talked about that, the command is back in verse number 10, but now we, we see the actual command, or the, the, the word for the command is back there. Now we see the actual command. What does he tell him to do? I say that, I, I'm really pointing that out for a reason. What does he tell him to do? Rise. You know my reason, don't you? What's our theme for the year? Arise. Okay. 
Here's a passage where the Lord Himself tells a man to rise, rise, rise and go to the street. It's the same word that Philip had heard back in Acts chapter 8. Rise and go to the, toward the south to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. It's the same word that Saul heard back in verse number 6 when the Lord told him to rise and go into the city. Okay, But now he's telling this man to rise and go. In other words, Jesus said to him, Ananias, get up and go. Get up and go. Now where does he tell him to go? This probably We may not get much farther than this tonight. Where does he tell him to go? To the street called Straight. Have you ever wondered about that street? Do what? Right if, what if it was crooked? Okay. We would say it like this. Go down to Straight Street. Go down to Straight Street. Have you ever wondered about that word, that, 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 that street? Here is a picture, one from about 1869, one from about 1900, of Straight Street in Damascus. I'm not sure those houses were all the same. Got a little, does have a little curve there in it, uh, Corey. But it's still straight street. If you jump ahead to 2017, you see another picture called straight street. About 2017. And we know it's straight street because if you look over there, there's an ancient Roman arch built when the Romans were in power leading to, guess where? Straight street. Isn't it amazing the Lord tells us which street this man is, has, has to go to, giving him directions. Here in the south, if we see an old house that has, you know, some, some age to it, maybe even dating back to the Civil War time, what do we call that house? Old. Right? We call it old. But in Europe and Asia, Bible lands, 150, 175 years old is still new construction. Because they have streets, and landmarks, buildings that date back not centuries, but millennia. Some of which are we know are over 2,000 years old. And so there are some things, sometimes when you, uh, I've never been to the, uh, to, to the Bible lands, never been over there, but I do know a lot of folks who have, and sometimes they will, uh, some of the guides over there will tell you, well, now this is where this happened, and this is where that happened, and and really and truly, when you start matching it up with Scripture, that's not really probably accurate. They just got their sights. Well, let me just say it this way. This ain't one of them. This ain't one of them. We know where Straight Street is. It's been there since the time of Saul. Wow. Absolutely. And about, what, a mile long or so? I forgot exactly how long it is. Okay? And, and so, uh, yeah, about a mile long. Street runs east and west, about a mile long. Got that in my notes here. Thought that was right. And so, here, somewhere on this street, maybe not in these houses, maybe not in these buildings, somewhere on this street is where God told, or Jesus told Ananias to get up 
and go, and he would find Saul. Wow. Who lived on Straight Street? I don't know who all lived on Straight Street, but I know one man who lived on Straight Street. And what is his name? Okay. Go to this man named Judas. Go to the house of Judas who lives on, on Straight Street. Uh, the only thing we really know about Judas, this Judas, this particular one, is that he owned a house on Straight Street. That's really the only thing we know about. And the word translated house here, according to Thayer, means an inhabited edifice, a dwelling place. A place where somebody lives. Okay? And so he goes to his house. Okay? Now here's your assignment. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself this question? Why was Saul at this particular house? Why was Saul at this house and not at somebody else's house? We're not just told that he was at a house on Straight Street. He could have said something like this when he told Ananias to go. He could have said, now go down and take the, look, go into the fourth house on the left. Could he not? He could have said, go down there and find the house with the red shutters and go in that one. Or found some characteristic about that house. Could he not? But he chose to say, go to the house of Judas. Why was Jesus, or rather Saul, at the house of Judas? His name also seems to have been Jewish. Now the word Judas is a Greek way of saying a, uh, a Hebrew name. If you were saying it in the Hebrew, it would be not Judas, it would be Judah. Judah. But we're, we're looking at a, a name that's, you know, given to us in Greek as Judas, okay? Was Judas a Jew? Got a Jewish name. Or was Jewish, uh, Judas someone else? If he was a Jew, would he have been a man who would have been friendly to Saul on his mission to persecute the Christians? Is that the reason Saul ends up at his house? If that is the case, then you have to wonder why Saul went there if now he's going to change his mission, don't you? If he's not going to do what he said he was going to do when he came, and it had already been set up for him to be there, or was Judas a Christian who had opened his door? And if so, why was he not afraid of Saul? So which was he? A Jew? Christian? Which was he? Did he become a Christian after the events that took place at his house? Now while you're thinking about that, I think it might have been Mr. Bill that asked this. I don't remember. What about those guys who were with Saul? I think he asked this last time. Did they become Christians? The ones who were going with him to, to persecute the, 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 the Christians who were there? What happened to them? Okay. Very quickly before our time is up, never mind. You study about it. And you tell me next week. Okay. I'm going to hold my verses until next week. All right. We'll pick up there next time. Let's close out with a prayer. Holy and righteous Father in heaven, we are so thankful tonight for the opportunity to, to come together and open up your word. Father, we pray that the things that we've looked at are, are the truth. And that Heavenly Father, we search them out diligently and determine them to be the things that are, are right. Father, be with us as we leave this place. Help us as we seek to live for thee each day. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.